Chapter 9 DNA Based Information Technologies. This chapter provides us with a discussion on decades worth of research that has gone into understanding DNA based information technologies as applied to biological systems. Besides, this chapter will also provide us with fundamental knowledge of DNA and RNA biochemistry that we will be encountering in later chapters. The learning goals for this chapter are as follows. First, we will start this chapter by discussing DNA cloning. Specifically, we will discuss recombinant technology. And in this section, a technique called polymerase chain reaction will be discussed in detail. Secondly, we will discuss DNA-based methods to understand protein function. Here, we will understand various different techniques that are applied to understand the cellular and molecular functions of proteins and protein-protein interactions. Last but not least, we will understand the human genome. Not extensively, but to a brief extent, so that we can make connections between how human genome extends and how biochemistry can be learned from genomics. Before going further, let us revisit and refresh our knowledge of DNA and RNA. Deoxyribonucleotides make DNA. And as you know, four different nucleotides, namely deoxyadenylate, deoxyguanylate, deoxythymidylate, and deoxycytidylate, five prime monophosphates, are the main components of DNA. The combination of these are linked together by phosphodiester linkages covalently to each other and the directionality of DNA goes from a 5' end to 3' end as represented by the position of phosphate attached to the ribose or the deoxyribose sugar in DNA. Ribonucleotides make RNA. There are two major differences between DNA and RNA. The first one is that RNA has a 2' hydroxy substituent on its ribose sugar, whereas deoxyribonucleic acids do not have a 2' hydroxy substituent. The second difference is that RNA has uridine, which is a nucleoside, which makes uridylate, that is a nucleotide, whereas DNA has thymine as nucleoside. The major difference between uridine and thymine is the base. Thymine has an additional methyl substituent at this position. Now, when these nucleotides combine together, to form a polymer, the directionality is the same as in DNA for RNA, which means the 5' end is where the nucleotide starts and 3' end is where it ends. RNA also has phosphodiester linkages. In the case of DNA, two different polynucleotide strands interact among themselves via hydrogen bonding interactions. This result in the formation of a double-stranded DNA as shown here. These base interactions via hydrogen bonding are termed as Watson-Crick base pairs. And in this case, adenine from one strand base pairs with thymine from the adjacent strand. 
cytosine from one strand, hydrogen bonds with guanine of the adjacent strand. In general, purine, hydrogen bonds with pyrimidine. Adenine and guanine are purine bases versus thymine and cytosine are pyrimidine bases. As you can see on the right here, the hydrogen bonding between adenine and thymine is weaker as compared to guanine and cytosine. The reason is that there are two hydrogen bonds in case of adenine thymine versus three hydrogen bonds in case of guanine and cytosine. Not all DNA is found in simple double helices. Certain DNA sequences have highly stable secondary structural features. A common type of DNA sequence is a palindrome that is shown here. A palindrome is a word or a phrase or a sentence that is spelled identically when read either forward or backward. For example, the word rotator is a palindrome. As you can see, rotator, if you re read on the forward or the backward direction, it reads the same. In DNA, the term is applied to regions of DNA with inverted repeats such that an inverted self-complementary sequence in one strand as shown here is repeated in the opposite directions. So this strand is from 5 prime to 3 prime and this strand is from 3 prime to 5 prime. And if you were to consider this specific palindrome, now this sequence has a twofold symmetry. To superimpose one repeat on the other, it must be rotated 180 degrees as shown by the red arrow, about the horizontal axis, and then 180 degrees about the vertical axis as shown by the yellow arrow. A mirror repeat, on the other hand, has a symmetrical sequence with each strand, as you can see, superimposing one repeat on the other requires only a 180 degree rotation about the vertical axis, as shown here. The self-complementary strand within each strand confers the potential to form a hairpin or a cruciform, like structures. When on different strands, palindromic DNA is often an inverted repeat. This allows pairing with the same strand in an alternative structure. Conversely, mirror repeats do not have complementary sequences within the same strand and thus cannot form hairpin or cruciform structures. And these structures are specifically formed in case of a palindrome. Double helical DNA or RNA can be denatured as shown here. In this specific example, denaturation of a double helical DNA is shown. And this kind of denaturation can happen via different mechanisms. The covalent bonds in this double helical DNA remains intact and that is important to understand. This means that the genetic code remains intact and is not lost. Only hydrogen bonds are broken, which means that the two strands that are interacting with each other, they separate during the process of denaturation. Base stacking is lost. Denaturation can be induced by high temperature or change in pH. Denaturation may be reversible. So if you denature a double-stranded DNA or an RNA and form two separate strands and then cool the strands, they can come together to form the original double helical DNA. And this process is called as annealing.
Now that we have refreshed our knowledge on DNA, let us understand recombinant DNA. They are artificially created DNA that combines sequences that do not occur together in the nature. Basis of much of the modern molecular biology involves these three different techniques. Molecular cloning of genes, one of the most important technique in molecular biology and it forms a fundamental part of synthetic biology. Overexpression of proteins, this is one of the fundamental technique that is used in biochemistry. Transgenic food or transgenic animals are essential in biology to understand and to delineate biological questions. This is what happens in DNA cloning. DNA cloning involves creation of identical copies of a piece of DNA or gene. Essentially, the definition for cloning, right? Also involves isolating a specific gene from the source of organism involved and amplify it in the target organism. What this means is that to make an organism of one's choice, one needs to obtain DNA from a source and that source can be a different organism. These are some of the basic steps of DNA cloning. Cut the source DNA at the boundaries of the gene. This means that a gene can be a long piece of polynucleotide and we are only interested in a specific portion of that specific gene. So you cut at the position where you want to. Select a suitable DNA or a vector and we'll talk about as to what a vector is in a bit. Insert the gene that you've cut from the organism into the vector and insert this new vector which is called as a recombinant vector into a host cell. And a host cell could be anything, um, typically a bacterium. And we will talk about this specific technique in a bit. Let the host produce multiple copies of recombinant DNA. So these are, these are the basic steps involved in DNA cloning. To understand the technique of cloning, it is imperative that one understand cloning vectors and plasmids. A vector is a carrier or a delivery agent and cloning vectors are DNA molecules that are capable of autonomous replication in a host cell. Most cloning vectors used in the laboratory are modified versions of naturally occurring small DNA molecules found in bacteria or lower eukaryotes such as yeast. A plasmid is a cloning vector. Plasmids are circular DNA molecules that are separate from bacterial genomic DNA. Now, bacteria has DNA that is circular. Plasmids are also circular DNA molecules, but they are different from bacterial genome itself. Plasmids can replicate autonomously, which means they can do it on their own. Origin of replications that are present in plasmids are there for use in bacteria and or yeast. Plasmids carry antibiotic resistant genes. Why? I will tell you in a moment. Plasmids allows cloning of DNA up to 15,000 base pairs. That's a pretty high number. And to be exact, cloning plasmids are mostly used 
for protein production. Biochemists use plasmids to engineer their gene so that proteins can be produced in host organisms, just bacteria. To clone whole chromosomes, which is up to 300,000 base pairs, one uses bacterial artificial chromosome, or BAC, and this is for use in bacteria. Yeast artificial chromosome, or YAC, is for, yeast, for use in yeast. A representative example of a plasmid is shown here. The classic E. coli plasmid PBR322 was constructed in 1977. This is a good example of a plasmid with features useful in almost all cloning vectors. Three important features. The first one being origin of replication and that is shown here. The origin of replication is a sequence where replication is initiated by cellular enzymes. This sequence is required to propagate this whole plasmid. An associated regulatory system is present that limits replication to maintain this plasmid at a level of about 10 to 20 copies per cell. Now this plasmid also contains antibiotic resistance. Now if you look at it, it has ampicillin resistance and tetracycline resistance. How do I know that these are resistant genes? Because ampicillin is an, is an antibiotic, tetracycline is an antibiotic. And these two regions shown in green or in blue are genes that can express proteins that have resistance towards these two antibiotics. Now, one of the reasons why these two antibiotic genes are incorporated in this plasmid is to allow selection of cells that contain the intact plasmid or a recombinant version of the plasmid. In addition to antibiotic resistance, this plasmid also have restriction sites and it has several unique restriction sites shown as PSD1, EcoR1, BAMH1, SAL1, etc. And these unique restriction sequences are targets for restriction endonucleases and all these names are the names of endonucleases providing sites where the plasmids can be cut to insert foreign DNA. In addition, the small size of this plasmid facilitates its entry into cells and the biochemical manipulation of the DNA. Particularly important to DNA recombinant technology is a set of enzymes made available through decades of research on nucleic acid metabolism. One such set of enzymes are called as restriction endonucleases. Restriction endonucleases recognize and cleave DNA phosphodiester bonds at specific sequences. They are common in bacteria. One of the reasons why bacteria have them is to eliminate infectious viral DNA because bacteria expresses these enzymes to recognize specific DNA sequences in viral DNA. Cutting phosphodiester bonds at specific sequences removes infectious viral DNA in bacteria. Now these enzymes have been engineered to be used as restriction endonucleases in recombinant DNA technology. Some of these enzymes make staggered cuts and they make sticky ends. What does this mean? Now, if a restriction endonuclease were to cut at a specific sequence, 
Why? Because it can recognize a sequence like this and cut at specific ends. Some of these enzymes can cut um, at ends and result in the formation of a sticky end, which means that after cutting the DNA, the resulting DNA has an overhang, either a three prime uh, or a five prime overhang or a three prime overhang. This is called as a sticky end. Some make straight cuts. If you make straight cuts at this point, you result in blunt ends, which means there are no overhangs. There are a large number of restriction endonucleases that are commercially available. And if you are a biochemist looking to do cloning, you can go to this specific website um, on NEB, a New England Biolabs website, and find out information on specific restriction endonucleases and order them for commercial uses. Shown in this table are some of the commonly used restriction enzymes in DNA recombinant technologies. And as I said before, restriction enzymes have specificities for specific sequences and they can either result in a sticky end or a blunt end depending on which restriction enzyme one is using. In addition to restriction enzymes, the second type of enzymes that are important for DNA recombinant technology are called DNA ligases. And the application of DNA ligase is in pasting a gene to a specific cloning vector. So restriction endonucleases are used to cut specific part of the gene from the source organism and DNA ligases are used to paste that specific gene to a cloning vector of your choice. Let us try and understand as to what a DNA ligase is. A DNA ligase is an enzyme that covalently joins two DNA fragments. For example, after the action of restriction endonucleases, if two sticky ends result, now one of the sticky end from the DNA backbone um, can be attached to the DNA insert. That results in a ligated DNA that is catalyzed by DNA ligase. Normally, DNA ligases are involved in DNA repair. Humans have DNA ligases running around, bacteria has, and every organism have DNA ligases at their arsenal. Human DNA ligase uses ATP versus bacterial DNA ligase use nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD. So there's a basic difference between the enzymes either present in eukaryotes, specifically in humans, or in a prokaryote like a bacteria. Finally, the most important question is why antibiotic selection? Antibiotics such as penicillin and ampicillin kill bacteria. Plasmids can carry genes that give a host bacterium a resistant against antibiotics. And this is important because most successful DNA recombinant technology techniques use bacterium as a host. And bacterium can harbor plasmids for storage or for expression. And because one is using bacteria as a host organism, Antibiotics are used for selection. They allow growth of bacteria that have taken up the plasmid, which means that a host organism that takes up this specific plasmids will have selection or will have resistance towards the antibiotics of the choice. 
any other bacteria that is going or growing along with this bacteria specific host organism will be eliminated by using this antibiotics. This is called as antibiotic selection. Ampicillin, which has this beta-lactam structure, can kill bacteria by restricting cell wall synthesis. Some of the common antibiotic markers are ampicillin, canamycin, tetracycline, and chloramphenicol. 